Great. So, um, like I said, I'm chair of grants and finance. Uh, we're really excited about this uh, opportunity. Um, so today we have Dr. Sarah Ackerman, who is a uh, former research fellow at Research America. Um, and she was also a AAAS uh, fellow supporting the US Agency for International Development um, in Global Health um, and in the Office of HIV and AIDS. Um, and she is currently a science engineering and technical advisor at Mantech, supporting the Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, um, in the Biotechnologies Office. So um, please join me in giving Sarah a warm welcome to uh, tell us a bit about um, fellowships and applications. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, so I thought to start, um, if you guys could all just put in the chat, um, you can put your name and sort of what stage of life you're at in terms of like, are you a PhD student? Are you a master's student? Are you an undergrad? Um, and any other information you'd like to put and I'll just take a look and then that'll help me um, decide what which slides to spend more or less time on. So let's all take a minute and do that while I figure out how to put the slides up. Okay, I'm just taking a look at looks like PhD student, postdoctor, fellow, PhD student, trial attorney, very cool. Okay, great. Okay, thank you all. That that helps. Um, it sounds like most people are in the graduate school to postgraduate school uh, time, so that's awesome. Um, so I'm going to go through these slides, and then if you have any questions, feel free to either just uh, I might not see the chat, but you can put it in the chat, or you can just unmute uh, and interrupt me, and then I'll be sure to save some time at the end for questions. Okay, uh, so this is just the first. Sorry. Oh, so this is just the first slide. Um, so again, my name is Sarah Ackerman. I did my PhD at the Rockefeller University. I studied obesity and breast cancer. Then I went to Research America, which is a nonprofit organization, did a fellowship there. Then I went to USAID, and now uh, I'm working for Mantech uh, at DARPA. Uh, and just a disclaimer that all of this is just myself telling you all what I've experienced and learned. This is not from any particular fellowship or any particular area, just my own opinions. Um, so basically fellowship opportunities, there are national fellowship opportunities, state fellowship opportunities, and nonprofits. Um, I have started compiling a whole list and then learned, of course, that there's a beautiful list. Um, so if you click on the link that um, Isabel has been putting in the chat, uh, or I added it here, um, you can see that there's quite a long list of different types of fellowships. And a lot of them, they can be really specific. Um, and so take a look and also just like bookmark them for your knowledge for the future. Cause sometimes, you know, you might've missed that application deadline, but you know, it'll come around again and you wanna make sure that you're aware. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about the two fellowships that I did. Um, and then if you have questions about other ones, I do know some information, but I obviously know the most about the ones that I did. So the first is Research America. Uh, so Research America is a nonprofit which advocates for science funding, scientific policies on the Hill. So it means it's a domestic based organization. It's really tiny. You can see all the people in the boxes there. That's about the whole size of the office. There's a few people missing, um, but that's it. Um, and they do really great work. So essentially large, large organizations provide them with funding and then they use that um, funding to advocate for scientists and to advocate for the people that uh, provide them with that funding. Um, so the Research America Fellowship, there is, there's actually three different fellowships, but there's one that's for um, PhDs, and so that's the one that I did. And so this is just information as of 2023 on their website. So it started at 54K a year. It's about three to six months long, so you wouldn't get that whole 54. Um, and it does include benefits. When I did it, it didn't include benefits. So if you were to apply, be very sure to ask. But the last time I looked, it does include benefits, which is great. You have to have a PhD or a terminal degree before you start, um, but you don't have to have it in order to apply. And then there's also a science communication fellowship, which at the time, let's see, this man here, 
He was a master's student. Uh, he was the science communication fellow. Um, and then there is a science policy internship. So this woman here, um, I don't think she's on the screen. There was another woman, uh, both of whom were uh, recently graduate undergrads or still undergrads doing that one as well. Um, a big thing to know about this fellowship is that it's a rolling application. So once they have one fellow, that's it's over. And then it doesn't open back up until that fellow is going to leave. Um, but again, they're three to six months long, so it comes around pretty fast. Um, but just to be aware, it's not like some of the other fellowships that have like a whole population of people. It's usually just one person. Um, what did I do? I put over there on the right. So I was there for, yeah, three to six months. I started in February of 2020. And then five weeks in, they sent me home and to never return to the office again, except for to pick up my stuff at the end. Uh, so it was definitely a different experience than I was expecting. Uh, before the whole world closed, I did go to the Hill. So I, they have, they hire a lobbyist and I went with the lobbyist um, uh, to advocate. And so basically the lobbyist would give the spiel about, you know, why do we need specific funding for, you know, this group? And then they would say, well, here's a scientist who can tell you a little bit about what that means. And so I was a scientist that's, you know, stood there and talked to people on the Hill. And it was really interesting and, and really great. I wish I had gotten to do more of it. Um, but then, yeah, COVID hit, so then I pivoted, so I wrote some blog posts, so they have a blog, and so I wrote some blog posts about COVID-19, because I was the only scientist, like only PhD scientist in the office, so I wrote about what is the virus, what are the tests, stuff like that. Uh, I wrote a white paper, actually, with, so this is Mary Woolley, she's the lead for Research America, um, and so I wrote with her, and also uh, Jenny, who I don't think is in this uh, shot here, but um, so that was really a great experience. Um, I listened to a lot of congressional hearings and I completed a self-directed research project. So that was what I first did when I moved to DC. Uh, anyone have any questions about the Research America Fellowship before I saunter on? You can always ask questions later too. No, okay, let's keep going. So then from there, from there I went to the AAAS Executive Fellowship uh, so AAAS is also a nonprofit. However, this fellowship, instead of positioning you in AAAS, uh, they find positions for scientists within the federal government. So the federal government is quite large. Uh, so places that fellows go is the NIH, National Institutes of Health, NSF, National Science Foundation, State Department, USAID, which is where I went, the United States Agency for International Development, and the Department of Defense, the DOD. There's also one of the VA, so the Veterans Association. Um, so there's, there's quite a few agencies. So just some top line information as of 2023, all fellows start at what's called a GS-12 step one, which is about 94K a year. It's one to two years long, so it's quite a bit longer than the previous one. It includes benefits, and you must have a PhD or terminal engineering degree before applying. So I'll show you the applications uh, system on the next slide, I think. Um, but that can be a real hindrance. And it's actually, that is why I did the, I enjoyed the Research America Fellowship very much, but I use I use that experience because I could not start this fellowship. It takes about nine months to actually start the fellowship. Um, so that can be really difficult, especially if you're a PhD student. Um, you know, they don't they won't keep keep you on after you after you've done your defense. Um, so additionally, you should take a look at the AAAS Congressional Fellowship. Um, I have some friends that have done that one. Um, AAAS itself only funds two people a year. Um, but there are other societies that fund people. So I think the American Chemical Society, the Biophysical Society. So if you're part of any of those during your PhD, they also fund people to do the AAAS. Just be careful because sometimes the benefits and the pay can be different. Not a problem, just to be aware that sometimes it's not, it's not equal for all congressional fellows. So just make sure that you're like aware of the differences and keeping up with that. Um, so then, yes, where did I work? So... If you ever work in the federal government, you will learn that they really like acronyms and they really like really long names. So I wrote it all out here, but essentially I worked on global health as part of PEPFAR, which is uh, President George Bush's initiative for HIV and AIDS. And I worked on the health workforce, um, which for folks that are, know what that is, I didn't when I started. The health workforce is um, like doctors and nurses and mentors that uh, support an initiative. So it was a totally new experience. So just getting you a sense of, I did my PhD in uh, breast cancer and obesity work. And then now, um, then Research America, again, about science, but like a completely different shift. And now USAID also a shift. Uh, so don't worry too much about, um, like it has to be, it can be about your PhD, but it really doesn't have to. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and then another key point is who employed me. So I was employed by two different contractors during my time at USAID. One is called ANMS, 
which is not too important. I don't, I don't think they are funding fellows anymore, uh, but I could be wrong. And the other one is AFPI. And so I put a link there. Um, and so that's the AAAS is, um, it's their funding group. Uh, so I'll explain that in a minute, but that's a good one to know about because they fund a lot of fellows. If anyone has any questions, just come off mute or, or interrupt me. Okay, so this is the timeline for the fellowship. It's really long. The big thing to know is the application is due November 1st. So at that time, you have to have your PhD. So I defended in October, and then I didn't actually have the PhD like paperwork in my hand because the actual graduation wasn't until the following spring. Um, but I got a letter from my university saying that, you know, Sarah has completed all of her responsibilities and has her PhD, and that was sufficient. So, but you have to have done your defense and have that paperwork by November 1st. So then I'll come back and go through all this if you guys want, but I don't want to bore you. <laughs> but essentially there's multiple rounds of the interview. You get a lot of emails. It takes quite a long time. You don't actually start the fellowship until September 1st of the following year. So it's almost a full year later. Um, and it turns out at the time, I mean, this is this is crazy and it is frustrating for a lot of people. It turns out hiring in the federal government, nine months is a little long, but it's actually not that long. Um, so it turns out this is actually pretty standard, um, but it can be frustrating and definitely something to know. So you might, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, maybe I'm imagining that I'm hearing things. Um, so you might be wondering, why would I want to do this? Why do I want to wait nine months for a job to start? Um, maybe you don't, but but if you do, um, some perks of being a AAAS fellow is that it's an opportunity to work in, within the federal government. It's pretty difficult um, to get in sometimes, right? Like how do you start with those positions? And it's, it's pretty complicated. So it's a really great opportunity for that. Uh, it's a network of fellows. It's like lovingly known as the mafia in the in the government. So people that are fellows are everywhere in government agencies. So you'll always find people that did the fellowship and that connect with you in that way. Um, there's also an access to a careers listserv. So they send out like people, like if your office is hiring and you were a fellow, you can go to the fellow listserv and send out that blast. And so that's a really great way to stay connected and keep tabs on possible careers. Um, and it is also the, the best paying fellowship that I'm aware of. I haven't looked at all of them but living in DC is expensive. Um, and so it's very, it's definitely possible to live on the AAAS um, stipend. Some other places, you know, it depends, um, but to live in Washington DC is not cheap. Okay, so this slide is a little intense, but I just wanted to put it all down there um, because it's really important for hiring in the federal government and, and the fellowship, again, for the AAAS fellowship. So on the left here is modes of hiring in the government. And on the right is security clearances in the government. So these two things play a role for AAAS fellows, depending on where you want to go. But they're good things to be aware of. So there's different modes to be hired in the federal government. You can be a direct hire or what's called a federal employee, which means that your pay and your HR is managed by the federal government itself. The only fellows that are hired in this way are NIH and state fellows. The next option is a contractor. So your pay, your HR, all that stuff is managed by a third party company. This is all other AAAS fellows. So myself at USAID, when I said that AFPI paid me, you end up in sort of a triangle where in one corner is AAAS, one corner is your federal government position and one corner is your contractor. It's a lot, but it's it's a, it's pretty it's standard for the government. Many people that work as support the federal government are contractors. So just something to be aware of. There's also contractors vary immensely. So just be aware that not all contractors are the same within different parts of the federal government. There's two other ones I'll put on here. So personal service contractor, it's called a PSC. It's a little bit in between the two. Um, essentially you contract directly with the federal government, but you are the contractor. So there's no third party, but you're still not considered a direct hire. And the last one is consultant. So the consultant and contractor sound really similar, but they're not the same. A consultant is like someone in DC, a big one is Deloitte or Booz Allen. Um, so if you work for one of these, you work for Deloitte and you like uh, are embedded within Deloitte's structure, but then you're put on projects in the government. So you might be a consultant at Deloitte who does some projects with the State Department and some projects with the Army and some projects with uh, DARPA and some projects with, so you, you move around and you're not like stationed in that office the same way you are as a contractor. So 
it's a little bit different, but it's a, it's, and it's none of the AAAS fellows are hired that way. I just put it on there so that way folks are aware. Uh, and then two more points, sorry. The direct hire is the quote unquote best employment mode. It's the classic, like good benefits, good retirement, all those kinds of things. Um, but most people are not direct hires in the federal government, including fellows. As you can see, only NIH and state fellows are direct hires. So it, so the contractor is, you know, it's definitely not a bad way to go. It's the way that I have gone so far, um, but just knowing again that they vary greatly, um, but you do get some benefits. Like I listed here, the AAAS USA fellows, when I was a fellow, they got $15,000 a year for travel or, or professional development. So that's something that the state fellows didn't get. And so we, we did get. So just to give you an idea, uh, any questions about modes of hiring in the government? I figure you guys can just use this as a resource later. <laughs> OK, uh, so then on the right is security clearances. So again, this only applies to some fellowships, but it's an important thing to know. Um, so I listed them here in, in increasing like uh, length of time and um, intensity. So facilities access, many AAAS fellowship fellows have this. It's pretty easy. You fill out a piece of paper uh, with your social security number on it, and that's sort of it. Um, pretty easy. The next one is secret clearance. Um, so a lot of USA jobs and most state and DOD fellowships at least require a secret clearance. Um, secret clearance involves what's called the SF-86. Uh, it's a very long form, but it's not a difficult form. You just fill out everyone in your mother literally, you know, a ton of people that you know and where you travel and all these things, but it's not, um, it's not a test or anything. It's just a lot of paperwork. Um, the next is a top secret clearance. So some state and DOD fellowships require this. The top secret SCI is the one above that. So again, some state and DOD. The next one is top secret SCI with a polygraph. I have never heard of a fellow needing this. It might be out there. I only know one person who has this and it's a, she did not a fellow. So, um, just letting you know the different fellowships that require this. A security clearance makes you more employable. So there's a whole, I think I put a link there under the word employable. There's something called clearancejobs.com or dot something. Um, and so it's a whole website full of jobs for people that have security clearances. Once you have one, you can search through there and you know, snap up job opportunities that you're interested in. Um, however, uh, in some cases, like particularly in the State Department, you have to wait for your clearance to go through in order for you to start the fellowship. So State Department fellows, even though they are direct hires, a lot of them end up not starting the fellowship. So they've already waited the nine months, and then they have to wait additional time for their clearance to go through. You know, I think a lot of people would say that that's not a problem and it's very well worth it, but just something to be aware of when you're applying and thinking about these things that the security clearances take time. Uh, I think it took me maybe two months to get a secret clearance and it took almost nine months to get the, the, the TSSCI one. So just to give you a, a frame of reference. Um, if you are a USAID fellow, however, you were able, at the time I was doing it, you were able to start the fellowship and be paid just as an interim clearance, just like working on getting the clearance. So that's a big difference between USAID and state. Um, so just to be aware. And DOD, I actually don't know the rules, but I, they are hired by contractors. So I bet I bet it's more flexible. But again, a thing as you're if you're going through this process, things to ask. I feel like when I did this, I didn't even know what question to ask. So hopefully <laughs> you have a little bit of a better sense of what to ask. Um, so I tried to distill it down to a couple points. So if you've learned nothing else about the AAAS fellowship, uh, AAAS, the organization, is not going to help you get a job per se, uh, but the fellowship puts you in an excellent position to be hired. So AAAS is going to put you in the office. You're going to work there for a year or so, but they're not going to guarantee you a position or, you know, but they do. It is a good place to be. Um, all government hiring takes forever, six months minimum for most things. Um, security clearances are valuable, and then your PhD counts as years of experience, and so it immediately puts you at a GS-11, uh, so don't sell yourself short uh, because you've been paid poorly in your PhD. Make sure that you're, you know, aware that you're at least eligible for a GS-11. Again, the AAAS fellowship is a GS-12. So I put some other useful definitions and some links. Um, so what is the GS scale? It's the government pay scale. The higher, the better. The higher the number, the better. Uh, so 12 is higher than 11. The foreign service scale is actually the inverse. So foreign service one is better than foreign service two or higher pay, not necessarily better, but higher pay than foreign service two. It's the opposite. 
Um, a project management professional might come up when you're looking at things. That's called a PMP. It's a certificate that many people have. Um, a lot of people did it during, I did it during COVID uh, because you couldn't use the money to travel. So you can use the money for a PMP certificate. I wouldn't get it to, to apply for the fellowships at all. But when you have the fellowship or, or if you're working somewhere and they offer you like professional development money, it's something that you can, uh, it costs a lot of money, but if you can get your company to pay for it um, and then you can be certified as a, as a PMP. Uh, USA jobs, I will say embarrassingly that for the first six months of my fellowship, I thought it was USAID jobs. And I couldn't understand why the United States Agency for International Development was also in charge of the job search for all government people. Uh, so it's not USA jobs, it's USA jobs. And it's the government website for direct hire positions. So you can take a look. Um, it's confusing, um, but there are a lot of filters. And if you do a fellowship or you're searching around there, sometimes there's whole sessions on like how to navigate USA jobs, but take a look. Um, the certification or a cert is a requirement you have to pass in order to get the federal government process started. It can be very difficult for people to pass the cert with a PhD, not because you're not eligible, but because uh, it's a person in HR looking at your application, not somebody in the office. Um, so be aware if you're applying for federal jobs, like make sure you've asked people like how to correctly format yourself. So that way the HR person makes you pass the cert and then you have the chance to be actually in the pool of applicants. If you do not pass the cert, your application never goes to the person hiring, even though that is kind of a silly plan. That's the plan. Uh, and then federal resume. So again, I said there's a specific format. Uh, you can find information about that online. I'm happy to answer the few questions, the few pieces of information I know about that, but the, the federal government is extremely picky. So if you don't have it formatted correctly, they will just throw it out. So these are unfortunate things. Um, okay, so the last thing is, what did I do as a fellow? A lot of people tend to ask that question. So I, they put a lot of text, but we don't really need to read it all. Um, but essentially, um, the United States government, generally speaking, they think of the plans they'd like to do, and then they hire people to perform those plans, and then they get information back from them about how it went. So the federal government, at least in most cases that I'm familiar with, doesn't actually like do projects in the field. Like they don't send, there aren't nurses and doctors hired in the federal government who then go places. It's the federal government thinks of the plan for how the nurses and doctors should operate for HIV and AIDS, they pay someone called an implementing partner, and that implementing partner then manages that pro that program. Um, so I managed uh, programs for Malawi, Tanzania, and Zambia. Um, I worked on an interagency team. And then I also worked with a lot of data. Um, so it turns out PEPFAR, which again is the President Bush's HIV and AIDS initiative, PEPFAR is big on data, which explains why they hired me. At first I was confused, but then I'm someone that can handle data, so that made more sense. Um, so I worked on a structure for how the data would be collected. Um, and I helped like explain to the folks that were filling it out, like how, how to fill out the form, what, what information was going to be collected, and then took a look at that information. Um, and I also mentored an undergrad's uh, summer intern, which was really fun. So you get kind of the uh, opportunity to interact with um, students in, in other uh, parts of their uh, career as well. Um, so yeah, so on a daily basis, I had team meetings, I did everything virtually, um, which is not so much the case anymore, but there were team meetings where everyone would come and chat, talk about what they were working on. I would have country calls where I would wake up very early to talk to the people in the different countries because the time difference is quite uh, significant. Uh, what else did I do? I would do a lot of data analysis. So I had Tableau, which is a software, and I would punch numbers and make uh, graphs and figures for presentations. I gave a lot of presentations. Um, so that was also really rewarding and fun. Um, so yeah, so if anyone has questions about the sort of stuff you do day to day, let me know. Uh, but it's very different from my, my old lab life. Um, and so now I shifted a little bit towards how to be a competitive applicant. And so this kind of goes for any application, I think. Um, and so these are just some examples, but instead of, I've listed them out here on the left, but I'll just tell you what's in the pictures. And these are some examples of things that I did and then wrote about in the applications. Uh, so on the left, this is the representative in New York City who was for where Rockefeller is located. So we like cold emailed her one day and, you know, ended up getting a, a meeting with her to discuss uh, a science policy issue. And so there 
there we are chatting with her. Uh, the .edu address you have actually does quite a bit. So feel free to use it for not just, you know, your folks from government, but also um, as speakers that you're interested in. Uh, this photo on the top right and on the bottom left is both from the science policy organization in New York that I worked with. Um, so, you know, get involved if you aren't already. Um, see if you can host a speaker. A lot of times these groups have funding. So that means that, you know, the, they, they'll help pay for the person to get there and, and everything like that. The bottom right was we were invited to the UN. Um, so that's the United Nations. Uh, and so we went and uh, actually this woman here, uh, she gave a presentation. And so we coordinated that, which was really interesting. Um, I also did classes. So the top two are from a class that Rockefeller University hosts, it's a science diplomacy course. The bottom left, this was a AAAS uh, science diplomacy course. I think they still run it. It's a slightly different structure, but this was 2018. Um, so I went for a week um, and, and did a bunch of work in DC. And on the right, he was not our president at the time. He was our, uh, he was former vice president at the time, um, but this is the AAAS conference. So I don't know, I can't guarantee that Joe Biden will be there, but uh, it's a great opportunity to network and meet with people and go to conferences and, and see what, what everything is going on with everybody else in science policy. Uh, here's a few more. So here on the top left is uh, the first like true NSPN um, conference. Uh, so the, the very first one was actually in UVA, um, but it was when NSPN was only like an Eastern um, group. And now at this point, it was a national group in 2018. And so I coordinated this. And this is the poster session of everybody coming together and meeting for that. Um, the bottom here and the one here is the AAAS Science Diplomacy Conference. Again, double check what's going on with that one. But I, I invited the speaker here, this man here, to give a talk about global warming. Um, so it was a really uh, unique experience. And this is a photo here of just for anyone with nostalgia of old uh, NSPN leaders, me looking a little tired after we're working on the event here. Um, so those are just some examples of ways you can get involved. Um, I think one other thing that I listed here is um, another way to do it outside of like, you know, your science policy groups or NSPN is join your university committees. It's something I didn't think about until after I left. Um, but like there's often like a student class president or my one friend, she was on a sustainability committee or there's a tech transfer office, which is like a little bit different, but um, your university probably has some policy related things because it is a science institute that, you know, has its own policies. So, you know, if your group doesn't, if you don't have a policy group or, you know, you want to do things in person and everything's online, you see what your university has as well. And those can, things can really be pivoted. Um, into, you know, a policy fellowship and also uh, publishing things if you can. So the more things like the JSPG is a, a um, policy publication. Um, you can also do like blogs or videos, put some examples here. Um, but the more things you show that really shows your commitment and, and you're working towards um, the goal. Okay, so the very last piece, I think, maybe there's one or two left here. Um, is what to include in your application. So I think the biggest thing is talk about what area of science policy interests you. So just saying that you're interested in science policy is like saying that you're interested in biology. It's like enormous. Uh, so try to hone in on specifically like what it is that you are interested in. And then once you explain that, then tell them, excuse me, um, how you got excited about that and what inspired you, um, because that can really like feed in. So like if your research is in global warming and you therefore really, you know, that's a really easy one. But for me, I was interested in science diplomacy. And so I was like, okay, well, how did I get interested in that? So I explained about like working in uh, taking the classes and like getting to meet all these different people and like seeing the connections of science like worldwide. Um, so sometimes it's really simple to explain and sometimes you have to like do a little bit more work to explain why you're interested in the area of science policy that you would like to work in. A big thing to know is that most people that read your application just control F the application and look for specific words. Uh, so as beautiful as your essay might be, make very sure that there are specific terms. So like if you are good at working in R, make sure you've written like coding some, or you think of all the keywords that someone could like control F for your skill and put them in there. If you really want to work on global health, make sure the word global health is in there. Uh, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but something that I didn't, not that I didn't know that people skim things, um, but we literally just like looking for that specific word. Uh, and so make sure all the specific words that you 
want are in the application um, and also show off your skills. So I think a lot of people think like, oh, everyone can do data analytics. That's not true. Um, lots of people cannot at all. They cannot manage data sets or uh, plan an experiment or all these different things. So make sure that you're selling your skills, both like hard skills of actual coding programs, but also like communication skills, collaboration skills, project management skills, like all those things and try to use as many, again, you don't want to sound crazy, but use as many buzzwords as possible, but without sounding like you just like took a thesaurus and thumb through it. Um, so then people also sometimes ask me what people do after the fellowship. Um, so I thought this was kind of fun. I just found a bunch of friends and listed, you know, what fellowship they did and then where they work now. Um, so I'll just run through some of the like big picture ideas here. So the first three folks here, they all did their fellowships. They did the AAAS fellowship in a different agency, and then they ended up staying in that agency um, or staying in an area near their agency. Um, and so in some cases, there are probably direct hires. In some, place, in some cases, they're probably uh, working for a contractor still, which is great. Again, no problem there. Um, uh, Adam, so he was a fellow at the DOE, and now he's a senior consultant at Booz Allen. So again, consultant is different than a contractor. Uh, Holly, she was at the state and now she's working at what I think is a nonprofit. I'm not actually sure what this group is. Uh, similarly, Brian, I, he didn't actually, he actually didn't do a policy fellowship, but he's a big policy buff. Um, and so he also works at a nonprofit at Duke Margolis Center. Um, Matt was a congressional fellow. So that's the other fellowship. He works at the British Embassy. Uh, my friend May, who was in the picture with the UN, uh, she was a CCST fellow, which is the California State Fellowship. She's now an associate manager at Regeneron. Victoria Schneider, she did the Research America Fellowship directly after me, and then she stayed at Research America. She's the Global Health R&D Advocacy Program Manager. And Catherine Shields, uh, again, I don't think she did a policy fellowship, but she's a big NSPN uh, person, and so now she's a Foreign Service Officer. Uh, so you can see sort of the wide range of uh, possibilities. And these are just some examples. There are many more out there. Uh, and then what have I done after my fellowship? So at the moment, I'm a science, engineering, and technical advisor, which stands, which is CETA at Mantech. So that's my contractor um, supporting DARPA. So DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the Biotechnologies Office. So I put my sort of three bubbles here, but again, paid and HR by Mantech, and then work in the office of DARPA on the floor of BTO. Uh, and the program I work on is um, PREPARE. Uh, and so PREPARE, if you look it up, it's um, using CRISPR technology to um, create medical countermeasures for viral, chemical, and radiological threats. Um, so it's a pretty cool program. Um, and so I essentially do like I don't do any lab work. Actually, when I first um, accepted the job, I reread the description. And I was like, oh my goodness, am I going back to the mice? Um, but no, it's a desk job. I go into my desk um, and you manage the project from that position. So kind of like an, an the NIH is a grant funder. So DARPA is a grant funder. And so you help manage those grants. And so that's everything from deciding what the grants should be about to managing the people that get the grants in the end, selecting the people that should get future grants, stuff like that. Um, so it's a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, a lot of reading scientific uh, information and making slides. That's what I do. And I think that's it. I think I had a, well, yeah, just a joke at the end. Um, so feel free to come off mute or I'll check out the chat here if anyone has any questions or if there's a slide you wanted me to go back to. Um, I can share these with um, Isabel and she can pass them around to folks. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. And I, I just want to put a little plug for if you'd like to get experience, um, if like if anyone here wants to get experience reading grants, um, that is what we do on the Grants and Finance Committee. So we read applications for the PDF and CDF, and we're happy to bring people on um, and learn about that. It also teaches you sort of like what is what makes a good application for not just our uh, application process, but also what Sarah is talking about um, and all the other. And it also tells you what's out there. I feel like it's a really good way, like, you know, you read these and you're like, oh, that's a really cool conference. Maybe I should go next year or something. You know, it's a little, a little of your own self-interest, but it's a great way to keep in touch with what's what people are working on and what stuff's out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I went ahead and plugged as well. NSPN also has a rating competition on right now with Forefront. Um, in addition to, I think JSPG also has a call out right now. So just more opportunities for 
padding out that padding sounds bad, but you know, adding things to your CV, getting that experience um, when you're applying for these kind of things. Sarah, if it's okay with you, I'll go through sort of the chat and the questions and we can just kind of- um... Sure, am I just blind and that I can't find the questions? Go ahead, you do it. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, someone had a, a question about uh, if the application process is the same if you're going through one of the societies. So I think that was about the congressional versus the executive. And if you're going through the congressional and you go through a society uh, for AAAS. That's a good question. I think they vary. I think you still, I think in most cases, you still have to have the doctorate, um, but there is a list. If you go to the AAAS website, I think I put a link in the slides and they, there's a whole list of all of the ones that uh, support congressional fellows. So then I would take that list, figure out who connects most to you, and then move that one over. To be funded by the AAAS, to do the congressional one, which again, there's two people for that one. That one definitely is the same cycle. You have to have the PhD, it's due November 1st and stuff like that. I think the other ones have different deadlines, um, but I'm pretty sure they, they still require the doctor before applying. All right, uh, next question, which you sort of talked a bit about uh, in your experience, but uh, advice for getting plugged into sort of ongoing science policy efforts. So um someone has an idea about an initiative and then they find out that actually people have done quite a bit with it so how do you get sort of plugged in with something that's like already going yeah i think the biggest thing is um connecting with people that are in the nspn space so i think the biggest way that i've kept up is going to AAAS and meeting with all of my friends from NSPN. And generally speaking, everyone's very like welcoming and excited to, to have you. Um, and so then from there, you can kind of see where things are connected. Similarly, if you're in your own like society, like your own policy group on your university campus and you go regularly to the meetings, you'll start to pick up on what people are working on and what people are interested in. Um, again, a little selfishly, reading grants and finance grants is a really good way to see what people have been up to and get an idea and also keeping track of the Slack. Um, so the NSPN has a pretty active Slack that lists out a lot of fellowships, a lot of opportunities, and then a lot of events like, like this event or other events. And so going to things. Um, I think it took me probably like two years worth of like not full time. I was like still a PhD student. But probably took about two years before I like went to a meeting and I knew like a decent number of people to like start talking to them. So it takes a little while. Yeah, to, the, to that, I guess too, um, how early is too early to start preparing for some of these applications? I mean, if you are having a good time, then as early as you can, um, if you, but I also don't think like, you don't have to kill yourself in addition to your PhD in order to be eligible. You know, I think being excited about policy doesn't have to mean I organized 27 events for five years. Like it can be, oh, I think about how my research is connected and I write these blog posts, you know, or something like that. Like there's a lot of ways to um, be connected without like going overboard. So don't worry that you have to do too much. Hi, sir. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just had um, a question about the like matching process. Can you talk more about that? Like, did you yeah. apply for USAID or like, I guess, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so I skipped all the text because it's it's terrible, but um, essentially there's, there's two rounds of interviews for the AAAS Executive Fellowship. The first round is a white paper. So they give you a topic and 48 hours later, you have to turn back a white paper. It sounds rough. It's really, it's, everyone has the same amount of time. So, you know, you, you do what you can. Um, and then they have like a, a panel interview and it was always virtual even before COVID. So they, they've they read your white paper and it, you've read it, I hope, since you wrote it. Uh, and you go to the round table and they, they spend about half the interview talking about the white paper and half the interview just generally about your interests and what you want to do. So that's the first step. 
And then if you pass that step, uh, which which many people do, if you get to these stages, it is a very good sign. So don't think that like everybody then drops out. Like if you're getting to these stages, that's a very good sign. Uh, if you get to the second stage, that's supposed to be like pretty much in. So that's 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 um in early April. So applicants alerted for selection for second round interviews. So if you get through that stage, it's a pretty good shot you're starting in September. But always be always be cautious until you have you know a real piece of paper in your hand. Um, so then in late April, you get a list of interviews. So basically everyone control Fs your application. Like all the all the government people in any agency, they have the opportunity to control F your application and then they can offer you an interview. And so you get a list of interviews. I think I got eight interviews. Some people got 25. Like I was on the probably like lower end, I think, but it, you only need one job. So it doesn't really matter. But then what happens? So you get your list of interviews um, and they, they tell you when you have to go. And then you also get the opportunity to look at all of the fellowship positions. So you yourself can go through and say, oh, well, they didn't pick me, but I think I'd be great. And so you can reach out and say like, I'd like to work there. So if you didn't get any positions at USAID, then you can say what gives and go to the USAID ones and see what you can get. Once you have them, all the interviews, in the olden days, they were in person. So it actually kind of limited how many you could do because you had to get from building to building and like actually be there. I did them all from my bedroom wearing sweatpants with a blazer on top. So I don't know what they do now. So probably some combination of the two, but that's how people did 25 interviews in a week, you know? Um, okay, so you do all those. And then what happens is you rank which position you want and they rank you. So it's kind of like a terrible like uh, residency matching problem. And then there's some kind of switch that's flipped and there's like a deadline and they start matching. And so what happens is that each office's first choice gets sent an offer. So if, if somebody is the first choice of five off offices, they get five offers. They have 48 hours to accept or deny those offers. So if they get five offers, which I don't think, I don't know anybody that got five offers, but if you get five offers, you can only take one. So once you take one, you deny the other four and those go back in the pool. And actually as a fellow, you can watch them close the fellowship position. So it's, it's actually pretty stressful and terrible. And I, I ate a lot of marshmallows, even though in the end of the day, it's like, it's going to work out, but it's just, just, it is a stressful situation. Um, so if there's one that you really want and you see it close, that can help you make a decision about your second choice, right? Like if you're hoping for your first choice, but the first choice is closed, like you should not you should not wait. Um, so I did get offered in it. So I didn't get offered one the first day. There's like a couple days of this. So the first day I got no offers. I was like, oh, great. Cool. I think it was the second day I got an offer and it was okay. Um, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, and so I was like, okay. Uh, and so I turned it down. And then I think the next day I got the USAID one. Uh, you can also email people. You can email AAAS. You can't email the, the government agency, but you can email AAAS and ask them like, how high up am I on the list kind of thing. They can kind of give you like a wink and a nod. Um, because if you're like number 20 for the job you want, then they're going to be like, take the other job, don't do it. Um, and then the other thing is if worst case scenario is you don't get, we're not going to get no offers, but say you get nothing you're interested in. You're like, I hate this. This is terrible. I don't want to do any of these jobs. And you don't get any of them. You go back into the pool and you re-interview. So I don't know anyone that didn't get matched. I know plenty of people that didn't get their first choice but no one that didn't match. Uh, and then you get your final offer and then you start September 1st. Did that help? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Um, yeah. It's good mm -hmm. to know that you can kind of gauge where you are um, when you're making that decision. So that's good. Yeah, you can definitely ask. I mean, they can't tell you like you're next, but they can kind of like try to help you out the best they can because they want you to be in a place you want to be. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, we've got one more in the chat about um, managing your time as you're finishing up the PhD and applying to these fellowships um, and sort of uh, getting through the PhD uh, when your focus is sort of on the, the SIPOL and the fellowships. Yeah, I don't know that I have a great answer for that one because it, it is stressful. Um, the fellowship application is much easier than your PhD. You know, like at the end of the day, you're writing a couple essays about yourself and you're coordinating some letters of recommendation. Like it's still a big deal. I'm not saying, but like 
at the end of the day, your thesis is the way harder part. So I guess I kind of saw the application as like a break from the thesis writing and like more fun writing about myself that was easier. Um, but it definitely was a lot at once. Um, I do think finding ways to be a postdoc when you apply can be just much more relaxing, right? Then you, I mean, not the postdoc's relaxing, don't wanna say that postdoc is relaxing, but in terms of the pressure, it could be nice. So seeing if your PI will let you stay on or finding other opportunities. So what I actually did is, so I, I did both at the same time, the defense and the application. I sort of like hurdled to the finish line. Um, and then my PI was very kind. And he said, you know, you can stay basically as long as you want, but at a certain point, you'll have to convert to a postdoc from a student. And that was a big hassle because I lived in New York City and it's the housing, like everything gets messed up if you switch to be a postdoc and it's not so easy. So I was looking around for something else and I found the Research America one and I, I applied on like a Friday and they called me on Monday. It was like, and they were, and it was like, can you start like in a few weeks? And I was like, I guess, you know? So anyway, I, I, I really, if I had known how good the Research America Fellowship was, I might not have even bothered to apply to the AAAS one. They really did a phenomenal job. Even though the world was over, they did a fantastic job. Um, and so that's how I, so then I filled the time basically with that, with that fellowship. But the actual application process is definitely tough to do both at once. Thank you. This is really helpful. I guess like also knowing that people are sort of in the same situation, um, like when it comes to applying for fellowships. I have like another quick question. Is sure. that, is that Okay. Um, and sorry, I can't start my video because I'm like okay. packing at the same time. Um, but um, talking about uh, letters of recommendation, like I come from a traditional STEM background and there's like no one on my committee that has like a specialty in science policy and sort of do this um, random um, science policy work outside of like whatever I do. And like what, what kind of people would you recommend to approach for letters of recommendation? Yeah, that's a common like problem because there's no like person. I think the best one I found is people that teach classes. So if you can get, if there is somebody in your area or, you know, that teaches a class on science policy, you take the class, you do, you know, you enjoy the class hopefully. Um, and those people can really be a good because they're usually professionals in their field. Um, NSPN at this point has quite a few people that are also professionals. And like when NSPN started, we were all like uh, third year grad students. Um, but now there's quite a few people that are NSPN folks that are. Um, so if you find someone that you're like, you know, they are in a similar space to you or something, like ask them if they want to get coffee, be virtual or in person um, and see if you can get to know them. There is also a mentorship program now at NSPN. Um, I, I, I work on that. I do that one. I guess I participate. That's the right word. Um, that could also be a good opportunity to find someone. Um, I also have written letters for people that were in my science policy group, even though at the time I was like, I don't know. I don't, I think I'd finished, but I, and not for AAAS. I wrote for the New York state fellowship. I wrote for someone for a recommendation because I was the leader of the science policy group. So as long as the person has a doctorate, and they know you, you know, so if, if you have like a science policy leader who has since graduated, that can be a good person. I did have my PI write me a letter. He knew, he kind of knew what I was doing, but not really. So he wrote me a letter. Another letter was written by someone who I took a class from and I, I knew him. And the third one was from someone I had networked with who was a AAAS science diplomacy person. Um, so I had gotten to know her through uh, AAAS meetings, I think, and then I had invited her to be a speaker. Um, I'd gone to DC to work with her, um, so just tried to keep that relationship going, and, and she wrote the third one. I'm also going to add a plug for um, if you do any of NSPN's, like the Science Diplomacy Fellowship, if you do SciPol Scholars, anything like that, you get to network both with your host office, and like Sarah just pointed out, you'll get put on teams with people who might be more farther along in their career than you and who might be able to write you letters of recommendation as well. So it's a great, like, um, uh, also a place where you can work on projects and sort of build these networks for people to write, write letters. But that is a tough issue. A lot of people have that problem. All right, we have one more in the chat about, um, have you seen folks who do policy fellowships at state level transition to the federal government? Mm 
No, but that could just be because I don't know them. I haven't run into somebody who did like the New Jersey state one or the Missouri state one and now works in the federal government. Not that I'm aware of, but it's certain. The thing about the federal government is it's very hard to know where to apply to. So almost no one I know is a direct federal hire, except for a few people who are AAAS fellows in state or NIH, and a few people who I just know through the world that have, have most people are contractors and trying to figure out which contractor to apply for in which office is like the worst matrix ever. So one huge benefit of doing the AAAS fellowship and being in the federal government is that you then get listserv, like people not beyond the AAAS listserv, but like if you work at USAID, jobs available, including the contractor names and the information come to you through um through your email address at USAID. Uh, so another thing to ask somebody, if someone has a really cool job in the government in, and they say, if they say that they're a Fed, you can ask like this, I don't know that much. There's like different tracks of federal employment. So there's different like codes and things. You can ask them for that information to help you like search in USA jobs, but probably they're a contractor. And so asking them what contractor they work for is helpful. And then once you figure out who the contractor is, you can put your application in um, and just say you're open to various things. A lot of times the contract, they want to hire, they want you to make them money. So also the way the contractor works, just to be clear, the contractor doesn't like out of the goodness of its heart pay you. They bill the government. So you get paid, I get paid by Mantech, but Mantech then bills the federal government for my costs. So don't think of it as like, <laughs> they're like these good Samaritans who are paying people to work in the government. They are 100% making money off of you. They are, and even AAAS is making money off of you. AAAS is a headhunter, basically, who headhunts you and puts you in the government, which is a good thing for them to do. But they also skim money off the top and make money off of you. So just, just so you know. Yeah. Um, but I think your initial question was state to federal, and I don't know anyone that's done that. I think I've heard of one person who did CCST and then ended up in the federal. But I think that's like word of mouth sort of a thing. Um, all right, last one of conscious, we've got two minutes left. Um, are all AAAS positions in DC? Uh, so the short answer is no, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. So USAID, for example, the second, like I had two contractors. This, the first contractor, you could work remotely. So, and everything was remote. So you could live in California as long as you woke up for the time difference, you could do the AAAS, the fellowship for USAID. The second contractor, there was a requirement that you had to live within the radius of DC. So that's different. There's also a lot of DOD fellowships are in Virginia. So they're in the DC area. I'm not sure how familiar you are, but they're a little, they sometimes require a car or they like, you could live out there and it'd be a lot less expensive than living in DC. Um, so there are some fellowships just like around that are a little bit out. Basically COVID flipped the world on its head. And at this point, I don't know. I think you'd have to ask on a case by case basis, but I have a lot of friends that work totally remotely for the federal government and live in Philadelphia, Colorado, California. They don't ever go in. Um, but again, there's different rules. Um, and the other thing to know about that is sometimes you get a pay cut. So if you do work that out, and that is an option for the office that you're in, sometimes they will pay you less because you're not considered in the DMV area. Um, and so that can, I mean, that's fine if it's, you know, but just to be aware that you may not get the same salary if you do choose to live somewhere else. Great. And I think that's that'll do it for us. So um, if everyone could please join me in thanking Sarah for a really awesome presentation and Q&A. Um, and please feel free to um, contact me or Sarah, I'm assuming it's okay that uh, if folks want to reach out to you, if they yeah, have Yeah, sure. Let me put my email in the box here. I can't find And uh, we'll make this presentation and uh, this recording available um, for if you know folks who uh, couldn't make it or if you just want to rewatch it. Yeah, sorry, now I can't find, oh, there we are. There's two screens gone, okay. So here's my email. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And I sent you the slides, but I'll send you another version, um, Isabel, so you can do with them what you will. Cool. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, everybody.
Have a good evening.